Hey guys, my name is Steve. I run Voss Running Suspension up here in Whistler. Welcome to another episode of the Tuesday Tune. This will be part two uh, of our discussion about grip. So what we are going to dig into a bit today is dynamic grip. So this is something that I brought up in the last episode where we were discussing the differences between steady state grip and dynamic grip. So dynamic grip, short version, is essentially it's the ability of a vehicle to keep a constant contact load at the tire or as constant as possible. What that means is we're really looking to minimize the fluctuation. Uh, there's a few different scenarios in which we need to consider this and a few, well, a lot of factors that affect it. Before we even go into this, I'm gonna tell you off the bat, it's not as simple as having a certain formula where you do A, B, and C that will give you optimized dynamic grip. If it was that simple, then we wouldn't be having to have these discussions. So this is realistically uh, an explanation of a concept for people's interest more than anything. It isn't necessarily gonna tell you a whole lot directly about, you know, follow this process and this will optimize uh, your suspension for grip, but it d will hopefully help shed some light on what the factors are that actually affect grip in the first place. Last week we talked about steady state grip and how that's affected by weight distribution and so forth. So I'm going to run through a couple of different scenarios here where dynamic grip is relevant and have a look at some of the things that affect it. So what we've got here on the old whiteboard is essentially a graph that shows hitting a single bump followed by a trough, something like a braking bump over time with a stiff spring and a soft spring. Now these arbitrarily stiff, arbitrarily soft, they don't mean anything numerically. What we have here is our static mean load. And what that means is essentially the amount of weight that would be on the wheel if you're just coasting along smooth ground. So we're only looking at one wheel at a time here because things get real complicated the more, the more degrees of freedom we put in them. So once we're looking at front and rear wheel at the same time, once we're looking at high frequency and low frequency, big motions and small motions all at once, then obviously it gets very, very complicated and it isn't something that I can easily draw up on a whiteboard and show you everything about how a bike works all at once. So this represents the amount of load that the tire will have on it and coasting along. We're coasting along, we hit a bump. With a stiff spring, we see a sharp increase in uh, the pressure on the tire. That means the vertical load on the tire, pushing it into the ground. And it's, it's really important to understand that because the amount of load pushing the tire into the ground obviously directly affects the amount of friction that we're able to generate. This also means that this is only particularly important when we're trying to develop any kind of friction at the tire. That means braking or cornering uh, or pedaling, really. But if you're not actually challenging the tire for grip, then keeping the tire on the ground doesn't necessarily matter. When we first hit this bump, we see a sharp peak in force. We see a large increase in pressure on the tire, and that means at this point, we would have a lot of our ability essentially to generate grip at the tire. That drops off and as the ground falls away, if we reach the point where the suspension is no longer able to follow, because that force in the spring drops off too rapidly or because the bump was not sufficiently absorbed and the, the chassis was moved up too far or because there's simply not enough sag to actually follow the ground, like the wheel just runs out of displacement where it can track downwards uh, to follow the ground, then we reach this situation where essentially the wheel leaves the ground, there is no contact force at all. So it goes without saying that the wheel leaving ground means there's no grip. No grip, not a great thing. When the wheel re-engages the ground, assuming it does it smoothly, then we'll see something like this sort of a force profile. That means that for this brief moment here, there is zero grip whatsoever. And so what we need to look at is essentially, you know, the area under this graph. How big is it? We also need to look at the variation because if you if I draw the graphs precisely to scale, which obviously I haven't because I'm drawing them by hand, the area under the blue curve, the soft spring, should be the same as the area under the red curve. So that means the area between, you know, if we were to shade all this, you know, everything up here kind of thing, that area up to this, you know, arbitrary endpoint should be the same amount of area as what is under the blue curve here. So if that area under the blue curve is the same as the area under the red curve, then in theory we have the same amount of average grip. But what we don't have with the red curve is the same degree of predictability. And so by minimizing the amount that this uh, that we vary from this mean line, 
Now, and keeping in mind that dynamically, this might not be the same as a static load really because your weight shifts and we have damping effects which we're not considering here. But even though the area under the two curves is the same, and so in theory we have the same total amount of grip that can be generated over this given time, what we are seeing with the, the stiffer spring is more variation from the mean. More variation means that, let's say you're cornering while you're hitting these hitting this bump. The dip in grip here means that, you know, the minimum grip that you can generate with the softer spring is this. The minimum you can grip that the minimum grip you can generate with the stiffer spring right then is here. So all of a sudden, we can only really push as hard as the as the weakest link. The the weakest link in the grip determines really how hard you can push to a certain extent. So say we were cornering with either of these two springs. Now with the stiffer spring, we see more of a variation from this mean. And what that means is that, you know, at this point, when we've got the bike mid-corner, we hit that bump. We have a lot of grip briefly with that stiff spring, but you can't actually make use of that very quickly because a rider can't move very quickly compared to what the suspension can do. You can't be turning more sharply on the top of a, the head of a rock all of a sudden just because you've instantaneously got that grip. However, when that grip drops away below the mean, then all of a sudden we have, you know, the tire is able to slide very suddenly. Uh, so then we can very quickly find ourselves in a position where either tire lets go and that initiates a washout. And so in cases like this, the ability of the soft spring to keep the wheel on the ground and to reduce the variation from the mean, that gives us greater predictability, greater confidence, and higher minimum levels of grip uh, at any given time. And that itself is worth quite a lot. However, this is a very simplistic explanation of what we call mechanical grip. So again, to reiterate, that is seeking to reduce the variation in contact patch load to keep grip consistent, predictable, and keep the minimum available amount of traction at a maximum. So when I say the minimum at a maximum, what I'm talking about is this minimum here, the higher we can keep that. So if we can go something that's even more gentle again, so if we could go something that was even more gentle again and keep the minimum grip up here, that would be better again than that, right? And so in order to achieve that, what do we need? We need a soft enough spring what does a soft enough spring mean? That means we need enough travel. Essentially the implication there is that you can't get a lot of uh, mechanical grip from the suspension on a short travel bike. There is a reason why downhill bikes have longer travel than cross country bikes. It's not just to save your hands. There is a huge amount of grip that you simply cannot get without enough travel. So with all that said, what we're really looking at here is one high frequency bump. And so by high frequency, I really mean a frequency that the rider himself cannot respond to. In the automotive world, this would be something like bump that the chassis, or a motion that the chassis itself can't directly follow, but the wheel can. So we're looking at a similar thing uh, with bikes. That means the rider can't directly react to a hit like that on his own. He can maybe anticipate it uh, a little bit and you know make sure that he's in the, in the right position and brace to deal with it, but the rider can't simply push the wheel up and down through that bump. Uh, and keep that mechanical grip from his end. Whereas with a bigger dip, you know, that like pump track is probably the, the easiest explanation to, uh, to visualize this. With big enough rolling undulations in the terrain, then the rider can actually keep the tires on the ground. They can push hard into the ground. And so those, that frequency, that sort of low frequency, uh, below about two, two and a half hertz, then the rider can be very, very active. And we've discussed this before in some of the previous episodes. There is an intermediate range of frequencies where the rider can partly deal with it, but the suspension is moving quite fast as well. The side, the amplitude of these uh, inputs to the suspension and to the to the tires and the, the chassis as a whole are at a size where it's not so big and slow that the it's almost entirely the rider dealing with it, and they're not so small that it's only the suspension dealing with it. An example of this would be something like hitting a berm or a very well supported corner at quite high speed, where the rate of compression is more than the rider alone would be able to fully compensate for, and the dynamic load shift on the tires, even if the berm is completely smooth, like it's concrete, the dynamic load shift on the tires is quite significant. So I'm gonna illustrate that on the board here. Okay, so that we can hopefully understand fully the dynamic implications of this. First, let's have a look at a static cornering situation. So we've got the wheel here, leaned over this angle here, our center of mass up here. There's essentially four forces acting on this in equilibrium. So we have a normal force on the tire, that's counteracting the force of gravity on the center of mass. So we have gravity pulling us down, we have the tire holding us up. That means we don't accelerate in either direction. We have a lateral force acting at the tire that's also acting at the center of mass through this line here. So the lateral force of the tire is opposed by the inertial resistance 
of the mass, but an inertial resistance is generating force as a response to acceleration. So what that means is that this mass here, the center of mass is being accelerated in this direction uh, all the time. So in a, a true steady state uh, cornering situation, which we kind of discussed last week, this should all basically balance out. And we're only looking at one wheel here, we're looking at this as a single degree of freedom problem. Between the two wheels, whichever one has the greater normal force will be able to generate the greater lateral force, and so that will determine which one has the more grip. But to consider this from a dynamic point of view, the normal force and the lateral force take some time to build up if we're not starting from, a, you know, if we're not easing into them essentially. Uh, and so what that can mean is, for example, say this rider had come down a dip into a corner. So we have a dip leading right, you know, like a sort of hard breaking into a, a corner, for example. If the rider tries to get grip from the tires, lateral support from the tires before the suspension has compressed to the point where we're generating sufficient normal force uh, as it comes down into there, then you can reach a dynamic situation where you're asking for lateral grip from the tires when the lag from the suspension, the time it's taking to build up that force, means that you don't have that yet. Even though it might sort of appear that you should, the fact that you are asking a lot of lateral grip, especially if the, the corner is supported fairly well, like it's uh, cambered well, it's a berm or whatever, that becomes particularly relevant. Then uh, what will happen is that the sooner we can get the grip, the sooner we can get the, the normal force at the tire. And the thing is, if this if this is uh, supported, the normal force might actually be through there, not necessarily just a purely vertical force, and that will make up part of the lateral force there. The sooner that we can build up the spring force and the damping force that we need, the sooner we can get the dynamic load on the tire. And again, this is assuming fairly smooth ground and whatnot, and we're not seeing huge undulations or bumps that are disrupting the contact patch. Uh, we're assuming that the tire is staying in contact and that we're only looking at the, the dynamics, the lag essentially, and how long it takes for us to get the pressure against the tire between the tire and the ground before we're asking for that lateral load. If you ask for the lateral load first, uh, it won't happen. There's nothing that it generated. As a result, all you do is wash out. In those situations, stiffer springs can be much more grippy because they can generate that force at the tire much sooner than a softer spring can. Likewise, compression damping can mean that while it's in that transient state, while we're compressing to reach that greater degree uh, of spring force, we're also generating force. Furthermore, we're not overshooting the mark on the uh, on the spring force. And so that is where compression damping can stabilize the bike as well as actually give us more grip. Uh, it's in situations like these that it really can be quite beneficial. It's not to say it's always beneficial, it does have trade-offs in other ways, so forth. Um, but that is the basic concept behind how we can control, how we can affect the dynamic dynamic load on the tires in those transient situations. In terms of our priorities when it comes to generating grip on smoother corners like this, whether they're supported or uh, flat, tires are obviously the single biggest one. So your selection of tires, your tire pressure, tire compound, casing stiffness and so forth, those obviously have a huge effect. That's number one. Secondly is geometry and body position. That's number two. So geometry makes it harder or easier to get your body in the right position to keep weight in the right place. But third is considerations of the dynamic effects of the suspension. If you run very firm suspension, like fairly firmly sprung, with firm compression damping and so forth, controlled rebound damping, you'll find situations like that actually work really, really well for you. And I think this is a large part of the reason why World Cup racers run their stuff so stiff. Uh, they've got to stabilize the chassis, and it's in those situations where they're hitting the ground hard, pushing into it very hard, that you can get a quicker response from a stiffer spring and uh, firmer compression damping. That does come with the trade-off, obviously, as just shown with uh, the dynamic grip at high frequencies, but these are low to medium frequency movements. That's essentially what we're having to try to balance is the stiffness of springs um, and damping that are needed for this and the, the softness that's needed to actually allow the wheel to track the ground at frequencies that the rider simply can't keep up with himself. Those are really the fundamentals of dynamic grip. I realize, again, this is not necessarily information that you can take the ball and run with and go to your bike and twiddle the knobs and come out and be like, hey, great, my bike is the grippiest bike that has ever existed. That isn't what this video is about, unfortunately. I would love to be able to offer you something like that. That is uh, very much case-by-case -case analysis. So the type of terrain that you're on, 
uh, will affect you know the, the type of setup that you need to go for. If you're racing in particular, let's say you're racing something that has fairly flat, scrambly corners uh, where you can't push into them very hard. So a lot of off camber would be a good example. Places like that, then the dynamic grip at high frequencies, the ability to keep that uh, contact patch load consistent, rapid variations of the ground roughness, that's when the, uh, softer spring rates become really beneficial. And conversely, if you're racing, for example, on a, a trail where you have a lot of support in most of the corners, then running a much stiffer setup can be really beneficial because you can load it up quicker. Uh, and not only that, I'm not just talking about as an entirely reactive thing, but the rider himself can actually be pushing down rapidly into the suspension and generating that force where it's needed. Uh, and if you watch like Bruni, Danny Hart in particular, I mean, I guess all the, the top World Cup guys, you watch them push into corners, you'll often watch them snap with their legs and really push hard into a berm or push hard into what looks like almost flat ground. And what that does is it allows them to generate grip dynamically and only momentarily while they're pushing, while they're generating that, you know, extra pressure on the tires, that allows them to actually turn a little bit harder. And that can be useful for very sudden, fairly small direction changes. Go and watch some of the Danny Hart footage from Maribor uh, from last year. There's some really good stuff in there where he's, he really is a master of that, I think. And that is why he is winning World Cups and the rest of us aren't. Anyway, guys, hopefully you found some, uh, interest, something interesting in there, um, something to take away from it and think about and maybe play with in your own setups. Uh, but until next time, we'll see you then.